Welcome everyone to another episode of Tales of the LGBTQ+. My name is Douglas Parsons. I don't have to remind you that the past year has been difficult uh, for myself and for everyone. A little bit of a backstage story. A year ago, I was in a different career. I was talking to people every day, being part of their journey, part of their stories, and exploring different avenues. For the past year, I've been mostly solitary here at home. My husband has been fantastic. We've been great with each other. We also recognize that we do have somewhat different personalities. Although I am an introvert by nature, I do have extrovert nature to myself. My husband, on the other hand, is a complete introvert. We joke that he's a mute. We joke about that um, realizing that he has a very difficult job. He does work at, uh, in the hospital system. When he comes home at the end of the day, he's been wiped out. And so these long form conversations that we would have before, we have to put to the side simply because of the nature of the world that it is today. I say all of that because I want to mention how much of a gift this podcast has been. By doing this podcast, I've been able to talk to people, been able to meet new people. In fact, of the first 10 guests on this podcast, only two of them I've known from before COVID. And so talking to people, getting to know them, finding out what makes them tick, finding out what makes and constitutes the person they are today, ah, oh, it's been wonderful. And there's a part of me that falls in love with each person because of their transparency and them trusting me and trusting you and sharing their story. Well, I don't know what the kids say today. I don't know if they say the word hella, but I am hella smitten with today's guest. Her name is Ashley Cardinal, and I want to say she is a young up-and-coming leader, but by saying young, it that somewhat sounds dismissive. So Ashley Cardinal is an up-and-coming leader. She's a leader right now. The past two years for her have been a huge growth period. At one time, Ashley did have addiction to substances. She has experienced homelessness. She's persevered and she's overcome and she's been finding her culture. And she has found that by learning her culture, she has grown and the Ashley that you are going to meet is infectious. If you're watching the video portion of this podcast, it's hard not to watch her radiate her love and her kindness and the excitement of how she's overcome and what she's going to do. And I just can't wait uh, for post COVID to be able to be in her presence, uh, to give the biggest gentlest bear hug and just say, you're doing good kid. And with that, I hope you join me today as we get to meet my newest favorite person, her name is Ashley Cardinal, and you are listening to Tales of the LGBTQ. Plus, that interview starts now. Hello, Ashley. How's it going today? I'm great. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks. So, Ashley, you came to my attention um, via Claire Perrin, who was an earlier guest on this podcast. And she said, you have to interview Ashley. She's an yeah. up and coming leader in the community and she's someone you have to look out for. So, of course, I 
snooped about you on the internet, and I absolutely agree with Claire. I'm, I need to find out more about you. I'm excited about this interview and, uh, and to learn more about you, uh, your identity, and what you have going. So let's get started. Great. <laughs> so, Ashley, we have this LGBTQ plus rainbow umbrella. Where do you fit in within this umbrella? What is your identity? My identity is two spirit femme. I kind of feel a little bit sliding scale, if you would like to call it. That's the easiest way I can compare how I identify um, within with my energies and my feminine and masculine energies. Um, so I, yeah, two spirit femme. I guess that's a simple way to put it. <laughs> Many of our listeners will understand what it means to be two-spirited, uh, but let's back up and a definition. What is uh, the meaning of two-spirited to you? To me, to be two-spirited is to take on not just a um, uh, identity within yourself, but an identity within the community. Uh, from my culture, I am Plains Cree, we have a history of two-spirit people. Um, there is actually a Cree name for uh, the two-spirited people, and I, I it totally slipped my mind, but it's uh, basically a loose translation of the in-between people. And so two-spirited also means um, having um, feminine, masculine energies within you and sort of the role within the community has to do with things such as culture, uh, uh, the spirituality, do things like the two-spirited people within our, in our history were the medicine people. They were the keeper of the orphans. They were the, the leaders in uh, councils. Yeah, my understanding with um, the history of two-spirited people is that they were put on a pedestal. Uh, they were put into leadership roles. Uh, a highly valued member within um, within the community itself. There's a term that you use, a femme on a sliding scale, and I I love the sliding scale part, and I don't think I've ever heard that used that way. So there, I know I'm going to have uh, some female listeners uh, listening to that and go, can you tell me more about that sliding scale? What does that mean? Well, um, basically, my how I identify myself, yes, visibly, I do within me, I feel femme. But there's certain parts of my spirit that are more um, on the masculine side. And I tend to be more on, um, like I said, sliding scale. Some days I'll, I'll feed into my masculine energies or some days I'll feed into my feminine. Some days I won't feed into either and I won't won't really it just be sliding scale um my even my sexual identity is sliding scale it's just who i choose to love and i feel more it's hearts not parts ah i like that okay i'm going to be writing down a couple of these things because i like these quotations so <laughs> that and that and on twitter that fits underneath the uh the 130 characteristics or something too so i'm going to use that one uh there's there's a term i've i've heard uh, and that's being used within our FNMI community, our First Nation Métis Indigenous community, uh, and the term is Indigiqueer. Can you tell me something about that term? Because that's something that's relatively new to, uh, to myself, and I'm not completely aware of what that means. Um, and did you clear? Uh, it's new to me as well. I felt I feel like it also it helps me with my own identity because of uh, the indigenous queer community. It's part, sort of like an umbrella term for the vast, like the variety of uh, or multitudes of different types of people and how they identify. Because one way a person identifies as two spirited, or even indigenous queer, is not the same way someone else would. So it's so vast and so broad that it's. Um, it just kind of like puts everything under the rainbow for the indigenous community. Yeah. And, and as she's mentioned, it's relatively new to you. So the term itself is changing and it's going to be identified or more hardened as time goes along. And I think that's part of why I love 
2021 is because there's all of these relatively newer terms that are coming out because people are naming things as we're talking about things and it's exciting and scary and overwhelming at times, but it's, it's nice. It's extremely nice. Now, our conversation today, we're going to talk about how you are the co-chair of the Edmonton Two-Spirit uh, Society. Uh, we're going to talk about the Red Ribbon Skirt Project that you are part of and leading. We're going to talk about the Bear Clan Beaver Hills House Group. We're going to talk about your spirit name. There, the Alberta Humanitarian Initiative. Oh, <laughs> I'm exhausted already. But before we do all of that, um, the people who are going to be listening to this interview just through the audio is going to miss this. But uh, can you show me your hands? Oh, oh, what is that bright shining thing that's on your finger there? Well, I got recently engaged on, on Sunday um, to my partner, Taryn. And so I've, I've been wearing this since we started. She gave me this as a gift when we first started seeing each other last year. And I just kind of been keeping it on my finger ever since. And then I got her a ring and I proposed to her on Sunday, I believe. Yes, yes, yes. And I saw that. Um, where did you propose to her? I was, we were actually on our way up the BAMP uh, gondola lifts with the, our two kids. And so on the way up, I was kind of like nervous all weekend because I knew that weekend was going to be the weekend. I just couldn't, we couldn't really, it was like kind of uh, Murphy's Law going on for us the whole weekend with things. And so it just, no timing was right. And then it just, I had something told me to bring uh, bring them a uh, ring with me on the lift. And then on the way up, I asked her and she said, yes. <laughs> That's awesome. Congratulations. That's fantastic. The postage of the video and everything, you can see the, uh, the, the nervousness, but the joy in both of you during that. Um, what do the kids think? How, what are the kids' reactions? Well, the uh, one and a half year old, he's too young to even really like, yeah. <laughs> but, um, the st our six-year-old, soon to be seven, she's been like the whole time we've been together. When are you guys getting married? When are you getting married? When are you getting married? When are you having babies? And so I asked her, and she was really happy. Um, she calls me mama. She calls Taryn mom. I'm yeah. So she's really she's kind of been the one that's like planting the seed a little bit. <laughs> I love that. Well, and and for both of you, you've had kids. Both of you've had kids individually, uh, and and now you've got the blended family coming together. Am I right with that? Sort of, yes. Um, the youngest one is not mine by birth. I am a kinship provider. I am taking care of my two year old, two year old nephew, and uh, her daughter is. Seven, going to be seven and yes so basically we are a blended family we're just really blended <laughs> yeah, just really blended yeah so so how do you navigate the world as being um two women obviously in love with each other having two kids that you're raising um you know how do you navigate this world when it when people judge or make comments or is it just to yourself it's just the way it is um, at first, like I just recently had come, um, I made public that I was two spirit. And, um, so at first it was really difficult for me because I've only dated, um, heterosexual males my whole life. And then she's the first woman that I've dated and, um, just clicked and I, we got a lot of flack at first, um, you know, a lot of individuals or people, I don't want to say who, it's just a fake or it's this or, you know, and it's not right and shouldn't be kissing in front of uh, Taylor or my, you know, my stepdaughter. But the way I see it is I don't, I've learned not to take what people try to project onto me personally and kind of been doing a lot of work on myself to decide what's mine to carry and what are other people's things to carry. And so that works really well for me. <laughs> um, I, I really just care about how the kids are, the condition of the, the home, um, whether they are, you know, 
being taken care of properly and they don't you know i've i've come to realize that care, kids don't really see it the way that adults do they just see love they just see love in the home they see that they're being cared about you know and that's what i love is that i can shut everybody out i can shut everybody out but these you know this house that i'm in it's our all of our safe place because we individually both my partner and i come from very like un uh i guess un not very satisfying lives you know separately and kind of have to live our own life outside uh not keeping in mind you know not letting the outside world affect us um so that's, that's how it is for us yeah, you're doing it right. As Mama Ru would say, can I have an amen? <laughs> uh, you know, it's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, And to figure these things out at such a relatively young age that you are at, it that's brilliant. You know, I'm still, I'm in my mid forties and I'm still figuring those things out. So I'm, I'm very happy to hear what you were putting down here. Uh, so let's put the kids aside for a second. <laughs> just for a little bit, um, because it seems to me that the last couple of years for you have been this huge awakening and this huge blossoming of who Ashley is today compared to where you were coming from. Uh, and so let's start with you recently being announced as being the co-chair of the Edmonton Two-Spirit Society. Uh, the acronym the acronym is E2S. So first, what is the Edmonton Two Spirit Society, and what is it that the group hopes to do? The Edmonton Two Spirit Society is a non for profit organization in Edmonton that serves the uh, Two Spirit and or Indigenous queer community within the Edmonton area, but soon hoping to expand to serve our Two Spirit community members outside of Edmonton and what we do is we provide services such as um, a counselor if you are feeling trigger warning if you are feeling having thoughts of suicide we're doing um, we're actually working on we do beating socials where it's, uh, we have it uh, people they send out beating kits and every Saturday like every Saturday there's a different project going on and you can go on Zoom and meet with the beading teacher and you can just talk and learn how to bead and there, um, do things like we're working on getting training for our, our members of um, suicide prevention, crisis, de-escalation, um, mental health first aid. We are doing things such as uh, providing COVID supports, whether it's financial or uh, mental and just kind of really shaping our 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 vision based on how we can support our two spirit or and indigenous queer community members during COVID. And so um, we have projects going on right now that I'm not allowed to talk about. But honestly, they're like I will when they come out. It's going to be an educational video series, and it's going to be so wonderful, like a documentary currently doing some filming and um it's really wonderful it's um being able to work with such uh i work with uh, a, a really diverse group of people and i feel this role that i'm in as the co-chair it gives me the opportunity to give back to my community and work alongside people who share that same vision in order to you know we, as we go along, you know, the needs are always going to change. There's always going to be a new gap to fill. And so the vision of E2S is to be able to provide systemic gaps such when eventually working towards wanting to, our, my vision actually is to uh, secure housing for the transgender, two-spirit, indigenous queer community in Edmonton, like, uh, because when I do my, I've, you know, my awakening about this part, wanting to do this was seeing the need on when doing street patrols with water warriors and bear clan. And a lot of our two spirit community members are um, members of the unhoused community as well. And so seeing, you know, looking at through that lens for uh, on a trauma uh, recovery focused uh, in a tra trauma recovery focused lens 
And so where we come in as E2S is figuring out how we can serve our community to the best so that we have, um, so that we can help our community heal or just give kindness and love to our community. Yeah. I'm extremely excited uh, to hear about the potential videos that uh, E2S will be doing. I was recently working on a curriculum project for a local agency. And part of that online mandate was to look at uh, Indigenous FNMI resources as well as our LGBTQ community. There was nothing. There was basically nothing that could be found that could fit within what we were doing. And uh, to, so to hear that these videos could potentially be made, that's a huge thing. And so I'm really glad to be hearing that as a curriculum developer in that background, as an educator, we need those resources. You, you just said so many things that we need to unpack. Um, I want to go back to the beginning, uh, though, when you were talking about the beating kits uh, and, you know, how these beating kits are sent out and time is spent together doing uh, this beating work with each other and talking. Um, there's a two part to this question with you. Um, can you tell us why this is important? And can you also then touch upon how it this ties into your own blossoming, your own awakening, um, in your own recovering as you've become this Ashley Cardinal of today? The beating socials, basically, in a lot of Indigenous cultures, we, uh, we consider beating to be a form of medicine and like a form of, I, you know, for me, because I have a background in art therapy, I consider it a form of art therapy because you're not just working with your mind, like say in a traditional setting where not a lot of people are comfortable speaking with like psychologists or therapists or anything like that. And it's kind of like our own meeting with, uh, gathering as a community and, you know, you, it, it kind of it ties into like the river skirt project too it's the sewing um it's beading it's doing um ta uh, hide tanning it's fishing it's hunting it's all of that stuff that helps us connect to our spirit as indigenous people so having beading and you know fellow community members that you can relate to one way or another, I feel like that gives a sense of uh, a community and a sense of belonging because um, not everybody can afford beating kits. Not everybody can afford the, 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 any, a lot of the things that people want to do or things that there's that gap of uh, the financial aspect. So what E2S has done is that we've turned it into the, they're called the beating socials and um, they send out like this big package. I got, I, I don't know if I have it on me. I don't have it on me. And it just got like a bunch of beads in it and it was free. Like, and they'll send, um, E2S sends um, medicines like sweetgrass and um, sweetgrass cedar and do things like sending out gift cards to help the community. And so now, what was your second question again? How it ties into my own? Your own background. Yeah, your own blossoming. Well, I have a, like, my history is um, not a very good one. I come from a background of trauma, addiction, intergenerational trauma and addiction, and a lot of mental health um, issues that never really addressed until later on in my adult years. And this position, going into the position as co-chair with Edmonton Two-Spirit Society, it's definitely helped me um, understand um, that there, my identity inside that my people, there's a, there's a, there's a whole teaching, there's whole, um, there's whole teachings and ceremonies and songs and, um, and it just makes me like, I can relate it to my own experience. It makes me feel like I have a place and I, you know, like that I identify somewhere with somebody. And though I am the kind of person, I'm a lone wolf by, by nature, I feel because I am doing this work with the community, it's helping me heal at the same time because when I get presented with new things that come up, like when the first time I did a, a street patrol, how emotional that, uh, a street, yeah, street patrol, how emotional that was and how eye-opening that was and the reality checks, you know, I'm very, I'm fairly new to my life now doing community work as compared to where I was up until I'd say 2019 is when I started doing 
my spiritual journey, I'm taking it a lot more seriously. I have uh, been in recovery going on it'll, in August. It'll be two years. I'll be two years sober. Um, <laughs> and so prior to um, our activism, I was in the oil and gas industry. And that kind of like was the cherry on top of the cake of my life where I know I needed to change because I was in an environment where it was, there's a lot of misogyny, a lot of racism, a lot of, you know, sexism, ageism, and I was overworked. I was underpaid and I just kind of like, I went, I was out to lunch for the last like six months of my job until I had a breakdown and I decided that I couldn't do it anymore. So um, you know, I was sexually harassed at my, my last job and that really like that, that sort of, I wouldn't say traumatized me. It just sort of like reach brought up old wounds to the surface of, uh, my own past and own things that I chose not to deal with, um, uh, due to just not knowing that there was a way out of the way that I was living. And so uh, 2013 was the first time I went to rehab and I spent about, I was 23 years old. I spent about four months in rehab. And so that's kind of where it started for me to like, but it was like the journey to like recovery was like this, you know, all over and just so not linear. Like I, I'm like, Oh yeah, if I deal with this, everything's going to be great. I didn't realize that healing is a lifelong journey. <laughs> and, you know, even like, even now it's, there's a lot of things that in my life that I'm, you know, I'm working on, but now given the position with E2S, I'm in a position to be able to stay outside of myself, not get stuck in my own head. And I feel like serving others in the community is where I feel my, um, I feel most needed and I feel most content with is helping other people because I meant if I, I got myself out of my, my situation and, you know, I want to give back. Um, and sort of do right after all of the messiness and darkness that was uh, once my life. Yeah, uh, it's that's fantastic. And when you see all the things that you've accomplished in the last two years, you you have to know that you are on the right track. You, you like you know this. Um, looking at indigenous culture and the medicine wheel, and you were talking about beading. Obviously, you knew a little bit about your culture beforehand and how important it is, but why was it two years ago when things went inside you and where you went, oh, my way out or my way to recovery is through understanding my own culture and the practices? Was there an epiphany with that um, where, you, you, where you allowed yourself to embrace your culture more? Is it that simple? Um, I grew up actually like from when I was a tiny little kid up until I was about nine or 10 in a cultural setting with my family. But I had a lot of, uh, a lot of traumatic things happen around that time where I had to leave. And so we lost that. I moved to a city and I moved out of my reserve and I lost that connection to, to ceremony. And I guess my spirit somehow knew that even from back and then having that feeling of being like a sweat lodge or even having a ceremony with myself, smudging, being in nature. I never really put the cultural aspect into my recovery as much as I should have, I felt like I don't need anything. I'm good. I got this. Like, I don't need nobody. I, I just don't have to drink, don't have to do drugs. But I was very humbly put in my place when I realized how important it was for me to connect with my own culture because of the fact that when it comes to ceremonies, it's a connection with yourself and it grounds you. And when I feel grounded, I feel like I, I have a better, I have a more clarity you mentioned something great about spirit and it's a great lead into my next question i understand that you have a spirit name uh, and this isn't just like a nickname that's given to you by friends but there's a deeper meaning and connection with that so can you tell me more about your spirit name I was a resident at the Palmakers Lodge treatment facility in 2013, and every Friday they had this sweat lodge there. And so um, one, the elder that was there at the time 
had I had been sitting with him after one of the sweats and he was I asked if he could give me a name and that's he that's what he looked at me and he said my name was Wind Woman and so that kind of just stuck with me and I never really used it during my I was still in active addiction after I got out of treatment and I never really I feel like that part of um that part of me was not quite it was still in like the the incubation phase you know not ready to there's still so much layers to unpack when it comes to trauma and recovery and so with a spirit name in in the cree culture you just you usually you can't just give yourself the name you can't just you have to do ceremony you have to do certain steps and you have to discuss it with an elder and you have to offer the elder protocol and protocol could be anything such as uh sweet grass sage uh, if, it, if you can monetary prints anything like that it just what you what you are willing to give in order to get that name because it, everything works in works in like synchronicity it's like you have to give something in order to get something and um with the spirit name you can you can get a spirit name at any time in your life even a non-indigenous person can get a spirit name that's a spirit name that's kept how you how you um how you connect with the higher like with the creator um um that's how that's how you are addressing when you do like your ceremonies and your prayers um, you're addressing creator, the higher, your, or however you choose, you know, your higher power with your spirit name. And that's how the spirits know you, not this, not, not what you see, but what's in here. Yeah, I, I love, I love the concept behind it. And I, I don't know if concept's the right word, but I can see for yourself, just looking at your life journey, being the wind woman with the blow, uh, blowing of the winds coming here and going there, but and now you're finding that steady wind behind your back and pushing you forward. It's it's quite beautiful, actually. Well, it, it, immediately after re, uh, recognizing who you are, uh, I saw a post that you made discussing the Red Ribbon Project, and um, you're currently working towards this. And on May 5th, there's going to be uh, a march, a walk, uh, a recognition. What is the Red Ribbon Project and what is taking place on May 5th? The Red Ribbon Skirt Project is a partnership with a few um, organizers, like a few ladies within the community. Um, we came together after seeing um, this happened in Vancouver. It was started by a woman named Jamie Smallboy. And she's, um, how it is, works is that um, we come together, we sew, we create um, red ribbon skirts and ribbon shirts for also our men and boys um, to honor um, missing and murdered Indigenous people. And we it sort of started out as the red ribbon skirt for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, but uh, we collectively felt like we didn't want to disclude our warriors because they are systemically just as, statistically just as much, um, they're statistically just as much in trouble as our women are. And so we are gift making, our goal is 150 ribbon skirts and I think 80 ribbon shirts and we are going to be gifting these to the family members um, of the missing and murdered and on May 5th which is the National Day of Awareness also known as Red Dress Day we are invited the families of um, the missing and murdered to come and walk with us from Churchill Square to Beaver Hills House Park and to honor their loved ones and so what we have do done is that we are making ribbon skirts with rainbows on rainbow flay uh, rainbow ribbons on them to honor their two spirit uh female identifying or non-binary however you choose to wear a ribbon skirt it doesn't really matter you don't have to be um a woman to wear them you you know how you identify is what you want to wear how you feel your spirit identifies and so with the ribbon shirts that too, we're going to be ma uh, making like sort of pride skirts and pride shirts to honor our rain, our indigenous queer to spirit, you know, community. So when wearing these ribbon skirts, there's a lot of um, spiritual and ceremonial 
practice and purpose behind the ribbon skirts because for many, many years, Indigenous people were not allowed to wear regalia. They were not allowed to practice cultural things thanks to, you know, colonization and the implementation of the Indian Act. It was, it was illegal for us to wear these, uh, to wear ribbon skirts or anything ceremonial. Um, and so I feel like wearing them now and indigenizing the spaces that we're, we're in here, like where I wear ribbon skirts all the time. I don't wear them just for ceremony. I wear them just because it's part of like, I love wearing ribbon skirts. I feel so beautiful in them. I feel powerful. I feel I'm, I'm connected with my, my ancestors and those who have sacrificed before to, you know, uh, the people that were not allowed to practice or be who they were and are, which is indigenous people. And so now with the ribbon skirts, that's kind of like a, a decolonization method is to wear them and share them with uh, the family members. Cause usually these ribbon skirts, uh, they can range anywhere. Each individually can go up to like $200, sometimes even more. And so we managed to gather enough donations and like community support so that we can able to do that. And uh, even with the GoFundMe, we're able to disperse some of that, find that those funds everywhere, like divvy it to little community initiatives, like some of the funds are going to be going to their clan to help support in the search for Billy Winnell Johnson. And so these, um, these projects kind of like tie into one another in a way. Yeah. Well, and it's important to say that um, there are over 1000 or over 1200 missing indigenous women uh, in Canada at this moment. Um, and there's some publicity about that, but overwhelmingly it doesn't get talked about. And it's only been in the last few weeks where uh, the BC government, as well as the Alberta government, have been able to announce um, the cell phone services being placed on what is known as the Road of Tears in Northern British Columbia, because there's no cell phone service uh, along that highway and many missing women um, have disappeared in that area. So it's 2021 and we're only now getting to that type of work, which was laid out in the reconciliation to be done, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a topic upon itself. Um, now, I'm always going to come back through things through my cultural lens. And I, I identify and I know that I am a cis male um, who's part of the LGBT community, but I understand that with my skin color, as well as my uh, hair color, my gender, that I have privilege. Uh, I've been able to create space for myself that others cannot. Now, I would love to take part in the red, um, red ribbon skirt march. For myself, though, I'm very aware of myself and not wanting to take over the space or those type of things. So do you have recommendations for an ally uh, when coming to something like this? What should I be doing during this time? What would be your recommendations? Don't wear the red handprint. Um, be respectful and remember that you're going to be work, um, on this day, you're going to be walking amongst family members of people who have been murdered and or are missing. So that you have to like look at it from a trauma trauma lens and to um, it's going to be emotional. It's not, it may not, you know, it's going to be, it's, but it, in this space for the allies is just listen to the elders there, listen, you know, talk to some family members, get to, you know, learn stories, get, you know, and then you could use your own social media platform or, or to share their stories, to keep their stories alive because there's so many um, missing and murdered Indigenous people whose stories are, are, are virtually forgotten and not talked about. And this is our opportunity as a collective uh, community to let the family members in the Edmonton area know that they have have, we 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 see their pain we recognize it we honor them and we're you know if I can we can help uh, plant the seed of healing within families somehow even you know with the gifting of a ribbon skirt and sharing space with them and allowing them to to honor their loved ones with and you know share, and sharing that space that's something to remember is that 
um, as an ally um, to just listen, to go there and be, ask questions, you know, not maybe not too invasive, but just to get to know the stories and keep those stories going and, you know, um, be that voice for the people that are no longer here as, you know, as an ally with privilege, you know, there could be a lot of stories that get told just by going there and, you know, even them telling you the story and you knowing their story, you know, that's, that's a step in the direction of, uh, of the truth. And, you know, the truth of, and the reality is we're in a human rights crisis violation that's been going on since, what, 1492? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. The systemic racism, which is built within all of our systems. Um, that's a topic upon itself, too. So much to unpack. Well, earlier you mentioned being part of the Bear Clan Beaver Hills House. Um, and the patrol that's taking place. And um, this is something that's been going on for a number of years, I believe. Uh, can you tell us more about the Bear Clan Beaver Hills House? The Bear Clan patrol started out in Winnipeg. And basically, it's kind of like um, similar to what Water Warriors does. Um, they do street patrols. They do community security. They do... We're basically... Because of the relationship that uh, many racialized uh, people have with police or law enforcement, um, it's we are basically the people that um, advocate for the unhoused or you know the unhoused community while simultaneously providing things such as harm reduction, um, food, water, um, warm clothing, uh, basic human necessities that us as you know we take for granted but these things um with the bear clan is um it's uh indigenous uh led it's indigenous run it's um a grassroots organization it's uh there's eight i believe eight chapters in on turtle island and edmonton beaver hills house is the most recent one uh there's one in Calgary. I know there's, uh, they call it the Sage Clan in Lethbridge. So they do like the harm reduction, all of that stuff. And so it's more so empowering the community to help those that, you know, are living rough, let, uh, to put it loosely. Yeah, the uh, the Water Warriors Yeg was mentioned in episode three of Tales of the LGBTQ+. Uh, Claire Parent, uh, who was the guest on that episode, uh, is one of the co-founders of of that initiative. And they're working very closely with the Bear Clan uh, in making sure that the homeless is being taken care of here in the city of Edmonton. So if you want to learn more about Water Warriors Yeg, I recommend you go back to episode three and uh, on all of our sites and uh, take a, more of a listen to that. Uh, you mentioned about uh, being part of your first patrol and going out and helping and how it there was a lot of things that were taking place and it brought up some things within you. Um, we do know that in Edmonton, as well as throughout Canada, there is a high percentage of FNMI Indigenous people who are homeless and living on the streets. Um, in fact, I believe you came across somebody that you knew uh, from before. Um, that It's a very personal question I'm going to ask you here, but can you talk about that experience and for yourself as being a co-chair of the Edmonton Two Spirit Society, does that just push in your initiatives and what you want to do? Is that now you've got more power within the system? Uh, for When I first saw somebody I knew on the streets, it was a really difficult reality check because it's somebody's mom that I grew up with and I always saw her in my community and then, you know, seeing them like that, it's like, there's something, there's that gap there. Like what happened? Like, how can, you know, like, and you know what happened with, you know, many indigenous folks, there's a lot of um, intergenerational trauma. And so 
going on these patrols kind of really puts a, a paints a picture of the reality of uh, colonization, the after effects of resident the residential school syndrome that you know uh, sixty school syndrome, day school syndrome, all of those things that you know um, it's very evident that there's uh, there's a lot of need and there's these gaps, like I always refer to calling them the gaps because there's a need there that's, um, how can we fill that need? And with, and seeing my own people, it, 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 it was, it's hard sometimes, but I mean, if I could be the, you know, one person to just offer them a kindness, um, then that makes me happy. Um, I know I can't fix I can't fix pe other people's problems, I, but I could at least, you know, offer them kindness while they, you know, just to be a decent human being. And um, with E2S, my position, I want to be more um, at the street level, connecting with um, people on a street level so that, you know, I could be there, we could have that initiative to somebody could be offered services and that, you know, those services help that person get out of, of um, being unhoused and into uh, something more stable or, you know, being treated, treating their, their trauma, basically. And I know that it won't happen right away. But there, you know, I have, I, I have such a huge huge love for my people and I have a huge um, I'm a huge believer in healing and um, healing and recovery and whatnot because and but I also have that lens of being somebody who um, has been on that side I've been homeless I've been on drugs I've been I've been down on my luck and what I keep in mind is during those times those people that just showed me a little bit of kindness and knew of my position knew what I was going through and just didn't make me feel bad about it, didn't put me down, didn't judge me, anything. It just was always just kind. And I'll always remember those people when I was down, the people that kicked me when I was down or the people that helped me when I was down and just walked with me. And so now it's kind of like a pay it forward for me to give back and help as many, you know, help my people um, and show them love and kindness. Do you think we're on the right track when it comes to truth and reconciliation in this country? Are we on the right track or are we just treading water? I think we're still in the early, early stages, but I think with this digital age that we're in and the amount of like the, I, are they called the millennial generation? The one like the current generation right now, Gen Z, I don't know. There's so many <laughs> different generations, yeah. yeah so with that, there, I find that this generation is more vocal. And there's a lot more social media platforms that people are putting to good use, like TikTok, raising awareness about the missing and murdered Indigenous people, or people claiming their culture, or claiming their identities. And so I feel like there's a, a little bit of an acceleration that could be put in the right direction of truth and reconciliation. I feel like we're a long way because, you know, it wasn't too long ago that it was just recognized about residential schools in the late 20s, like, you know, that the one, that piece of paper, that apology that Stephen Harper um, gave uh, on behalf of the Canadian government. I mean, yeah, it looks good on paper, but uh, there's still a high amount of suicide. There's still a high amount of, um, I think it is about six, roughly, last time I checked, 60, roughly 60 reserves that are have boil water advisories or do not drink advisories. We have a lot of addictions um, stemming from untreated, unresolved trauma. So there's so many like elements to it to say uh, there. I'm coming, trying to be as positive I can, but like realistically, like reconciliation is it's there. There's a lot of work to do. Yeah. And there's only so much that we can talk about my next question or our next topic, uh, because it is a police investigation and it and because of the behind the scenes, what hasn't been revealed. Um, but earlier in the conversation, you mentioned mentioned a young woman who has been um, um, tragedy has taken place. Uh, and the Bear Clan has been involved with patrols and search parties. From what you can say out loud, can you tell me more about this case? Billy Winnell Johnson is a young Indigenous woman um, 
who went missing in December of 2020. I think it was Christmas Eve from her partner at the time's apartment. And so what the media or what is not known is um, the search is basically, um, he's already been charged. He's he's in jail right now, um, responsible. It's just finding, there's a lot of evidence that he, there's just no body. And so what Bear Clan is doing is helping the family out with searches um, sometimes during the week and weekends go search the Enoch area because the Enoch area is where his cell phone was last pinged. And so why Bear Clan got involved is because the police in, uh, have only been out to help search for her for her once within the last, like how many, it's been January, February, March, well, going on four months now and they've only been out once. And so the community has taken it upon themselves to do it themselves because when it comes to the police and the amount of and the high amount of missing and murdered indigenous people, they don't take it seriously. And sometimes, you know, um, there's uh, police involvement in these people. They called like simple can refer to as like the starlight tours. You know, that's why work, why Bear Clan was formed because the relationship between indigenous people and like the RCMP or any kind of policing services is not very good. And so it's like, we're we're more when they see our when they see the bear clan they're more prone to they're more prone to be wanting you know they're it's a different experience as when they see a police officer showing up trying to you know and for the most part when it comes to um police intervention there's actually there shouldn't be police intervention like when it comes to mental health mental health checks um and when it comes to billy and johnson they don't take uh, our people going missing seriously. It's like similar to um, the Amber Tuckero case. They didn't start investigating or taking her her story seriously because they're like, oh, she's just out partying. She'll she's fine. And that's like the worst possible thing you can assume about somebody. And yet, that's we're so desensitized to automatically assuming that somebody lives a high risk lifestyle. Even being indigenous is a high risk lifestyle. Being born indigenous is like a you know automatically being a woman, an indigenous woman, is you're you're a high you're high risk already. Just to, you know statistically, and that's. Unfort, you know, that's where this all ties into one another, how it all like um, kind of intertwines with one another. And so with the search, um, it's just one example of many. Um, there's been many that have happened before um, when people go missing um, within the indigenous uh, community. We don't really, they, Reporting to the police is like it's kind of it's difficult because because of the um the biases that the police have towards indigenous people, so they're automatically assuming that somebody's on drugs or they're you know they're stuff like that without even you know people women have gone missing just from walking out out of their house. There's a lot of human trafficking that goes on, and so even in Edmonton alone, there's um, roughly sixty indigenous. Uh, people missing and or and or were murdered or, or, or missing right now out of the Edmonton area alone. So that's a very like one is too many like sixty people that the they they just they'd rather go uh, you know I don't know they just the priorities of uh, of the priorities of police or anybody is different and it's like it's it's sad how not prioritize our our indigenous people are when especially when it comes to like them being murdered and or or are currently missing we have to take it you know if it was a white kid that was missing if it was a white woman that was missing there'd be police and dogs there all the time like you know stuff like that and unfortunately because she's indigenous it's so like the the the, de the desensitizing of of how to approach um missing and murdered cases is it they're not taken as seriously as they should and it's half assed excuse my language no nope, you can <laughs> swear as much as you want here <laughs> i'm trying not to but <laughs> yeah and so uh we have the people there's call outs there's a group on facebook it's called the search party for 
uh, Billy Noel Johnson. And if people want, in the Edmonton area want to come out and help, you could join in that Facebook group. There's the family members. You can meet the family members. And um, they search different areas. And they're working with a organization called the Wings of Mercy. And the Wings of Mercy is kind of a, it's a non-for-profit that does, uh, they set up ground search parties. They, they do uh, uh, drone searches. And so that's, they've been out there with the family every weekend since January um, doing ground searches. And now they're going to be putting drones and uh, expanding their search in the Enoch area. So that's, that's a good thing. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate that they're, these things, you know, the, they shouldn't be, they're not taken as seriously as they should be. So, you know, that's where the community comes in. It's like, you know, we have to help our own. Well, and the police are using the excuse that it costs too much, uh, too much money to do a search, uh, plus other things. Um, hey, let's call for what it is: systemic racism within the police services. And I, I've been helped greatly by the police services. There's things that have taken place that the police have helped me. I recognize, though, my skin color, my gender, et cetera, that when co- goes to it. Um, with our missing women, our missing men, children, and what's taking place, let's call it for what it is. It's genocide. It's absolute genocide of a culture, of a people. And we need to make sure that we we say that. Um, well, <laughs> we're coming to the end of our time. And uh, I can tell you right now, I can understand why you are the co-chair of the EQS because uh, when you talk about passion and knowledge and the last 10 minutes there, I was spending my time going, yep, yep, yep. (laughs) There's, there's, there's our leader. Um, Missing, murdered and exploited indigenous people. uh, We need to be more aware of, and we need to have this conversation. Um, there's a number of different websites, which, um, which Ashley is able to tell us about, and I'll make sure that, um, those websites are popped up during this, um, during this visual, uh, podcast. And we'll also make sure that these websites are listed, uh, wherever, um, this gets publicized and promoted. Uh, is there a site that you want all listeners to go to today, um, whether it's Red Ribbon or for the E2S? Is there a website that you want people to go and search for right now? There's a few, actually. You can can also, there's, uh, if you're not in the Edmonton area, you could, there's, um, there's a, M. There's a ribbon skirt project going on in Vancouver, and there's also one going on in Calgary. Um, You can check out that on Facebook. It's the MMI2G2S ribbon skirt march in Calgary. I don't know the exact name. There's so many acronyms. It makes, yeah, (laughs) it's hard sometimes. Edmonton Two Spirit Society website, www.e2s.ca, and it talks about our mandate, our our vision, the projects we're working on. You can meet, uh, see the board members, and I uh, could apply to be a member of the community, uh, the two, uh, be a member of the E2S community, and you could get sign up for emails. And if you are uh, a member of the Two Spirit and or Indigiqueer community, you could also join and you could be a part of it and you could get things like free training, you can get medicine, you could get connected to ceremony and cultural aspects. So if you're in the Edmonton area and you don't know where to go and you're questioning your identity, come to E2S and we'll help you out. We have uh, Two Spirit counselors um, that we have been um, sort of contracting that are uh, to help with the members in our community that are experiencing suicidal thoughts. And so there's that. And uh, soon you could check out 211 and E2S will be there. I just, I'm not entirely sure when. And you could also check out our, uh, the search for Billy Winnell Johnson Facebook page. You could check out the Red Ribbon Square Project on in uh, for Edmonton, you could come down to the the church. We're at Saint Faith's Saint Faith's Anglican Church, one one seven two five ninety third Street, and we'll be here right up until the first, doing as much sewing as we can. We've switched it from Monday to Friday, one uh, ten to three, from um, 
Monday to Friday, no, sorry, Monday to Wednesday, 10 to 3, and then Thursday to Friday, Thursday, Friday, it's 1 to 8 p.m. So anybody that can't come during the day can come in the evening and you could come learn how to sew. You can come uh, meet your community members. You can come in, you know, just sit in good, you know, like we have a bunch of tables in this big space and we're all socially distanced. We all have our own little sewing machine and it's just nice to connect with community members and, and, and connect with people who somehow are affect, also affected by the why we have to create the red ribbon script project to begin with and so it's nice and it's nice to meet like-minded people come have some snacks come say hi and so that's my big um, that's my shameless promotion for the project <laughs> <laughs> you can tell in your eyes and you can tell in your voice hey final question for you what would the ashley cardinal of today say to the 15 year old ashley cardinal if you had the chance to going to be a rough journey, but you'll be okay. And just um, love yourself as best as you can throughout this whole messiness, because somewhere down the line, things are going to change for you. And it's not always going to be difficult. So um, what you're going to be experiencing in the next 15 years is not easy, but you'll turn out, you'll be okay. Yeah, she's going to be more than okay. More than okay. <laughs> you're a leader, Ashley. I'm so... I'm so happy to have been put in contact with you and uh, yeah, you're, you're doing really well. And I'm, I'm thrilled that you've been able to share your story with us today. Um, this entire, uh, the entire reason for doing this type of podcast is to identify people who have a story to tell. And it's a love letter to the community in many ways. And I'm just so thrilled that uh, there's people like you out there who's spreading the love and making that type of change that we need uh, within the community, our own LGBTQ plus community, uh, two spirited community, but our community as a whole. And um, yeah, chosen family, it's important. So thank you, chosen family. You're doing well, kid. <laughs> so uh, to everyone who's listening, on behalf of Ashley, uh, thank you for listening to our conversation today on Tales of the LGBTQ+. Uh, my name is Douglas Parsons, and uh, come back to us next week. Until then, be good, and please remember to text when you get home. Until next time.